It's October 16, 1972. The security detail of Congressman Hale Boggs and Nick Begich are waiting for their arrival in Juneau, Alaska at 1 p.m. The flight is already two hours past its original scheduled time of arrival. With air traffic control confirming that they have not heard anything from the congressman's plane, the men are officially confirmed as missing. What will follow is the largest search in United States history at the time, conspiracies of a government cover-up, and a disappearance that remains unsolved to this day. This is the story of Flight N-18. But how did we get here? Let's go back to the morning of October 16th, 1972. A small Cessna 310C arrives at Anchorage International Airport in Anchorage, Alaska. The frigid Alaskan weather is not always welcomed by small planes like the Cessna, but thousands of planes have flown this route before, and thousands of planes will fly it after. The weather report for the day is mild, a cold overcast, gray skies, and mild visibility. Nothing that causes air traffic control to stop the experienced pilot Don Johns from continuing en route to Juneau, Alaska. So, at 8.54 a.m., the pilot and his passengers, United States Congressman Hale Boggs and Congressman Nick Begich, take one last look at the frozen tundra before climbing into the small aircraft to head to Juneau for a campaign fundraiser. Once they return home to D.C., they will continue the fight for Begich's re-election campaign as Alaska's sole representative. The last person on board, Russell Brown, is an aide to Congressman Begich. He thinks about his future. Being the youngest person on the plane at age 37, he wonders if he can follow in his superior's footsteps. After one last maintenance check, the four men buckle into their seats and depart Anchorage at the scheduled 9 a.m. time slot. At 9.09 a.m., the Cessna 310C relays an affirmative to the air traffic controller when asked about survival gear and an emergency transmitter. The path this crew is embarking on is a simple one. They're going to fly out of Anchorage, down the Turnagain Arm, through Portage Pass, into the Prince William Sound, and finally they'll follow the freezing Alaskan coast down to Juneau. A few hours after takeoff, the residents of Whittier are able to hear the faint sound of a small nearby plane. This sighting coincides with where the plane should be on their route to Juneau. A few hours later, with the time now being well past the scheduled time of arrival, authorities are being notified of a current missing plane and all of its passengers. At approximately 1.30, authorities begin calling local airfields and nearby cities to see if the plane landed at another location and if the pilot failed to notify those in Juneau of the plane's detour. After all the airfields report back that there are no unplanned aircraft that had landed, the physical search begins. 30 minutes later at 2 p.m., the United States Air Force orders the already airborne Lockheed C-130 to start scouring the original route to search for the vehicle, any signs of a crash, any sightings of debris, or the passengers. After a few hours, however, nothing is found along the coast or along Portage Pass. Over the next few days, 40 military aircraft, 50 civilian planes, hundreds of ships, and thousands of ground personnel will search 575 miles of Alaska's coast for a small 27-foot Cessna 310C. The Army even goes as far as taking one of their most effective spy planes, an SR-71, to aid in the search for the four missing men. Within a couple of days of this, however, the spy plane is not found to be as useful as the searchers would hope. While the spy plane was ineffective, a tool that would be very useful to searchers if it was on board is the plane's Emergency Locator Transmitter, or ELT. This transmitter is required by the United States government when flying planes, and what the plane was agreeing to with the affirmative message they sent earlier that morning. Despite this message, searchers find the pilot's transmitter in one of his planes in Fairbanks, Alaska. This turns a game of echolocation into finding a 27-foot needle in a 665,000 square mile haystack. At the United States Coast Guard station in Long Beach, California, the Coast Guard received a call from an anonymous tipster claiming that he knew where the plane had crashed. The man said he had access to experimental electronic equipment. He provided detailed directions of the coordinates to the downed plane, and according to recently released documents, the FBI found the source believable. 
One agent even wrote, quote, the source of the aforementioned information is reliable. Agents who interviewed the man reported that he, quote, appeared rational, extremely intelligent, but somewhat strange. It's not clear whether searchers checked the coordinates the tipster provided, but the plane is still missing and the tipster was never followed up with again. In the hours and days following the disappearance of the plane, several independent ham radio operators in Northern California reported hearing a transmission from someone on the downed aircraft broadcasting that there were survivors still on the plane. After interviewing those who claimed to hear these transmissions, the FBI concluded that their evasive nature and lack of cooperation was evidence that there was no real transmission occurring. According to the FBI file, the day after the plane vanished, a search plane picked up a signal 40 minutes some distance from Juno, from what searchers believed was a crash locator beacon. The searchers heard another weaker signal 150 miles northeast of Anchorage, but search planes could not pinpoint the source of either signal. Moreover, the NTSB concluded that N-18 was not equipped with an emergency beacon, nor did the pilot possess a portable one. Many investigators believe the plane crashed somewhere between Portage Pass and Johnstone Point, about one hour into the flight. One question remains though, what caused the plane to crash? On November 24th, 1972, 39 days after the disappearance of the four men and the Cessna, the search was called off, and 35 days later, on December 29th, the men were declared dead in Alaska State Court after just seven minutes of jury deliberation. It has been almost 50 years since the disappearance of Hale Boggs and Nick Bike, along with the two other men, and here we stand at a crossroads. Not one of how to accept their deaths, but a differing opinion on how they perished. There are those that walk the road most traveled, one that explains their death with details of the harsh Alaskan climate, ice, and clouds. However, there are also those that believe the road these men attempted to take was rigged to the brim with explosives. The more accepted theory is the one that the National Transportation Safety Bureau offered with their report that the plane crashed into the unforgiving Alaskan tundra after encountering icing, low ceilings, bad turbulence, and poor visibility. Icing occurs when ice is present on the plane through an accumulation in cold weather. The presence of ice causes airflow to go over the wing and the tail of the aircraft, which reduces the lift and can cause the plane to stall. In narrow areas like Portage Pass, this could lead to a collision with the jagged edges of the granite walls. Second, there's low ceilings. This just defines where the clouds are located in reference to the ground, so a low ceiling means the clouds are close to the ground, which reduces the visibility and is a condition that's unflyable with pilots that don't have instrumentation. Lastly, there's turbulence. Turbulence can cause changes in altitude and attitude and a general loss of control of the plane for a short period of time. The pass is relatively narrow at only half a mile to 1.5 miles in width, this supports the official narrative for how the plane disappeared. Due to poor visibility, the pilot was flying too close to the walls of the pass. The icing mixed with turbulence caused the plane to jet towards the wall, killing all four men instantly. This theory, though, has a few holes. First, there was never any wreckage, so any details are pure speculation. Second, the residents of nearby Whittier reported hearing a small plane pass over them. This town is at the end of Portage Pass, meaning that the plane would have successfully escaped the pass and could not have crashed inside. 17 months after her husband was declared dead, Peggy Begich married a young man by the name of Jerry Max Paisley. The marriage would only last two years, and in 1994, Paisley would suddenly confess to authorities that he was responsible for the disappearance of Flight N-18. Paisley was already in prison for the murder of a man in an Arizona hotel, and while he was incarcerated, he decided to list the details of his other illicit affairs. Paisley described how he was ordered to take a briefcase to Anchorage, and that was later revealed to him to be a bomb. When he returned the following day, he said the men who sent him exclaimed, quote, something big was going to happen. Within a few days of that comment, Flight N-18 would go missing. The revelation of the explosive was allegedly during a fishing trip where Paisley's business partner said that the bomb was placed on Flight N-18 before its final flight. After local investigators heard of these allegations, they contacted the FBI, which strangely never followed up with any of the local detectives and tried to shut down any possibility of investigating this further. 
The FBI had also alleged to have wiretapped Boggs' phone due to his controversial opinion that there was more than one shooter in the JFK assassination. An opinion that was all the more valid as he was part of the Warren Commission, the government-assigned group who investigated the JFK assassination. These two are often linked as evidence of the FBI's shutdown to the evidence raised in 1994. However, the revelation came almost 20 years after the disappearance, so it's likely that most of the FBI officers had moved on, so this would be more of an organizational effort, which is harder to conceal. The last thing I want to say about this theory is that if there was an explosion, the debris would have likely washed up onto shore somewhere like with MH370. MH370 was the flight that disappeared over the Indian Ocean in 2014 and pieces of it later washed up in Madagascar. Unlike MH370, the search area was much smaller, so debris would have been easier to see by the extensive search team, but none was ever found. Nick Begich is survived by his son Mark, who is the senator for Alaska from 2009 to 2015, and Tom, who is the minority leader of the Alaskan State Senate as of the time of recording. He is also survived by four other children. While both theories have a large amount of circumstantial evidence behind them, neither have anything close to concrete. The fact that the plane was likely sighted beyond Portage Pass puts doubt on the idea that the plane crashed inside of the pass. On the other hand, there's only one person who claims to have any knowledge of the plot to blow up the plane. People who are already in prison for life are likely to confess to murders that they are not responsible for in a form of sick notoriety. If you remove the connection that he has to the one congressman's widow, there's no merit to any of his accusations. To me, the likely answer lies in what was said about the pilot who was supposed to take them to Juno and an excerpt from an Air Force expert on the day of the crash. There were multiple documented instances of the pilot, Don Johns, flying in a more erratic and careless manner as he was reported to have flown the men to Juno despite the less than favorable conditions so that they could make their fundraiser. Second, according to the NTSB, most aircraft disappearances or accidents happen during low ceilings, which is the exact weather that was present during the flight. Lastly, in the NTSB's report, an expert that was searching with the NTSB said that in his opinion, quote, there's no way they made it to Juno in these conditions. Here's what I believe happened. After staying above the clouds beyond Portage Pass, they likely encountered icing, which caused the plane to suddenly lose power and nosedive. Due to the lack of a co-pilot, there was no attempt to make a distress call, and the plane likely crashed into the Prince William Sound where the plane now will forever reside at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean.